My name is Adam Barth. Um, I'm the uh, TL for Flutter. Uh, prior to working on Flutter, I worked on uh, Chrome for about seven years, uh, mostly on Chrome's rendering engine, which uh, started out as WebKit, eventually became Blink. And uh, then working on Flutter for about uh, two years, and this talk is going to be about the rendering pipeline in Flutter. So just to sort of orient ourselves, let's, uh, this is sort of a sketch of the overall architecture of Flutter. So at the bottom, there's an engine. And the engine is, uh, exposes a very low-level API. And if you uh, saw Ian's talk, he talks a, a bit more about all these different layers and how they relate. But um, so the engine is very smart about text and also knows how to take vector graphics and uh, draw them onto the screen. Above that, there's the framework, which is what this talk is going to uh, talk more about, which is itself con uh, composed of several layers. This talk is one of the about one of the lower levels in the framework called the, the rendering layer, which is responsible for uh, organizing the screen, so allocating space on the screen for various different widgets and then actually making those widgets appear uh, on screen. And then above the framework is where you uh, write your application. So the full pipeline so I, uh, in Flutter has a lot of steps in it. And um, so first you get some user input, like the user touches the screen, then maybe you have some animations running, so they start, tick, start ticking, and then you get uh, a chance to build widgets. So you get to build whatever you want to have on your screen. So you have one of a button, or a drawer, that sort of thing. And so Ian went into uh, detail about how that build phase works, how it is that you end up building things and constructing render objects. And then after that, you go to the rendering phase of the pipeline, which consists itself of three steps. So first is the layout step, uh, which is about positioning and sizing uh, elements on the screen. Then there's the painting step, which is about figuring out what those elements actually look like. And the compositing step uh, basically stacks them together in draw order so that they can be composed on the screen is one, one thing. And then finally, the last step there is rasterization. You actually go from, from that abstract representation of what you're going to draw to the actual physical pixels that are going to appear on screen. So this talk is going to focus on layout, painting, and compositing. So the sort of thesis or the like design principle behind the rendering part of the pipeline is that simple is fast. So basically, if we use simple, straightforward algorithms with very well understood uh, properties, then we can make them go fast by taking advantage of those properties and optimizing them. So for example, uh, both layout and painting use a one-pass linear time algorithm. So we walk the tree from top to bottom, and then we return up the recursive structure, and that's it. So that's in contrast to other systems, for example, where they'll do multi-pass layout, where they'll, they'll go to a point in the tree, they walk down to gather some information, and then walk down again to adjust the sizes of things. And if you imagine nesting that, you can see very quickly how that becomes n squared work, because you keep recursively walking down the tree and back up. And so in this system, we want to have a one-pass layout that just uh, walk the tree once, touch every node once on the way down, once on the way up, and then uh, could figure out how big and where everything should be with that. The other, uh, sort of along the same lines, is we use a very simple constraint model to do layout. So for example, in UIKit, they have this complicated a linear constraint model and a whole general purpose constraint solver to figure out where to position things. And that's, you know, that has some benefits, but we thought, what if we could do something much simpler? So our constraint model is basically a box with a min width and a min height, and a max width and a max height. And that constraint domain is very easy to solve, right? If I give you two of those constraints and ask you to unify them, pretty obvious how to unify them. And so you can write a very simple constraint solver. And the question is, you know, our thesis is that's enough to generate very expressive layouts. And finally, uh, we do all of our repainting structurally. So instead of tracking which like rectangles on the screen are invalid and need to be repainted, we do it structurally in the same structure that the, the overall tree has. So we can say this subtree, it needs to be repainted as opposed to keeping track of which rectangles on the screen. And that turns out to be a very big performance win. Um, it takes advantage of some of the hardware capabilities in, in modern like mobile devices. They're very good at, at um, compositing things. OK, so the first phase I want to talk about is layout. How does layout work? So the base class that everything that participates in layout and painting uses is called render object. So render object itself is a pretty abstract concept. Basically, it has an owner, which is the, the object that's going to drive the pipeline. And an, each render object knows what its parent is. But in general, a render object doesn't know anything about its children. All it knows how to do is visit its children, um, which means different render objects are free to have different child models. 
So for example, you can have a render object that has a single unique child, or a render object that has a list of children, or a render object that has a several named children. And from the perspective of all the rest of the algorithms, we don't care what the child model is. It's totally up to the render object. Um, but it does know how to lay out and paint in sort of abstract ways. And importantly, there's this concept called parent data, which is a slot on a render object that the parent render object can store data. So if you're familiar with other systems like the web, you aren't allowed to put like an inline inside of a block, for example, because block needs to store information on its children that inline doesn't have slots to store. And so you get these anonymous render objects in your render tree on the web to basically convert the data structures. And so we avoid that just by having this parent data slot that's managed by the parent instead of by the child. And that'll become important um, when we talk about positioning. So importantly about render object, it has no concept of any coordinate systems or anything like that. It just knows that it exists in a tree and has a parent. Um, and it defines this data flow that I talked about. So this is the one pass data flow. So we uh, walk the tree in a depth first traversal um, and we pass down the recursive walk constraints. So from render object's point of view, there are arbitrary constraints. Um, in practice, most people use a thing called a render box. Um, so those boxes will be this box constraint that I talked about. And then up from the bottom of the tree comes the size. So I say, here are the constraints on how big you're supposed to be. And you say, thank you for those constraints. I'm gonna go talk to my children for a little while. And when I'm done, I'm gonna go respond and say, oh, I figured out I want it to be exactly this size. Make sense so far? Yes, good, I'm seeing lots of people nodding. So that's sort of abstract, but more concretely, it turns out that a very useful coordinate system to work in is Cartesian coordinates. So, you know, X and Y and width and height. So there's a specialization of render object called render box that is much more opinionated about how things are sized and positioned. In particular, it has a size, which is a width and a height, as opposed to a render object could be an arbitrary thing like a, you know, sector on a, on a circle or something. Um, it also adds some intrinsic sizing information, which is, uh, comes up in some esoteric cases. So box has the idea that we're gonna use a particular kind of constraints, is box constraints that I mentioned. So box constraint is basically what's depicted on the slide. So there's, in the width dimension, there's a min and a max, and in the height dimension, there's a min and a max. And the rule is, if the parent gives you these constraints, you have to be somewhere in this light gray region. You aren't allowed to be too small and you aren't allowed to be too big. And what's interesting about this is that you can actually express a lot of different layout algorithms using this simple box constraints. So for example, the simplest kind of layout uh, algorithm is basically where the parent determines the child, the size of the child. So if you imagine you only had downward information. So each parent was like, okay, you're gonna be exactly 100 pixels by 200 pixels. And the child was like, okay, first child, you're gonna be 50 by 50 and you're gonna be 50 by 100. So this is commonly used, for example, in window managers in operating systems. The window in a, in a desktop operating system has no opinion about how big it's gonna be. The window manager says, you're gonna be exactly this big. And you can actually model that with box constraints. What you do is you make the, the constraints tight. So you set the min and the max width to the same value and the min and the max height to the same value. So the child is basically dictated, you have to be exactly this big because that's the only value that satisfies the constraints. So what this implies is that any object in the system has to be prepared for its parent to dictate exactly how big it is. So for example, the checkbox widget, normally you think a checkbox widget has a fixed size. It can only be exactly this size. But it turns out in this system, since the parent can force it to be an arbitrary size, it has to think about that and understand what it would it mean for me to be twice as big as I expected. And so the checkbox does something simple, like he just like centers his little checkbox in that available space but he's able to occupy arbitrary space. So another uh, layout paradigm is called within height out. So this is, for example, what the web uses. This is a very useful uh, paradigm for text. So basically you say, I want you to be exactly 200 pixels wide. How tall would you like to be, right? So if you could imagine you have a bunch of text and you set the width, you start flowing the text, make different line breaks, and then you see how many lines you got, and that's how much height you have. And so that actually arises quite naturally in this model where you just set the width to constraint to be tight and you set the height constraint to be loose. And then the parent is essentially specifying the width and the child gets to report the height that he wants to be. What's interesting is actually because this model treats width and height and basically X and Y symmetrically, 
um, you get the opposite. You get height in without also arises naturally. And you could ask yourself, like, why would I care about this? What is this? Why does this make sense? And, I, you know, the longer I work on this project, the more I realize that whenever you have a, like, uh, horizontal use case, there's always a vertical use case that arises for the same thing. And so later in the, in the talk, we'll see, actually see this actually arise naturally from something. So I promised you I was going to tell you about parent data. So what's interesting, if you notice about uh, render box here, he knows his size, but he doesn't know his position. So this is in contrast to other systems like Coco, where each UI view in Coco knows it's rect, right? And a rect combines both size and position. So here, you know your own size, but you don't know your position. Your position is here controlled by your parent in your this opaque parent data field that you hold. So what that means is when the parent gets the sizes for all those children, he's then free to reposition them without talking to them again. So without touching them, he can move them around. And that turns out to be quite powerful for things like scrolling, where you want to scroll a widget and move it around without touching it, right? You just want to do the minimal amount of work to translate things around. So I, I want to work, walk through an example of, of how layout works, and I was going to do uh, flex layout. So flex layout is a very, very common uh, layout paradigm. So the idea behind flex layout is you're either going to lay things out in like a row or a column. And here we're going to do row for simplicity. And some of your children have a strong opinion about how big they're going to be. So they have some sort of preferred or intrinsic size that they want to be. And the other children are flexible. Basically, they're going to expand to fill however much space is left. And, um, and, and actually, there's a little um, detail about this, which is they have different uh, flex factors. So if you think of them as like springs, they have springs with different strengths. So in this case, this yellow guy, he's got a flex factor of two, which means he's, he ex likes to expand twice as much as the pink guy who's only got a flex factor of one. So these, uh, you can, if you like, you can think of the green and red guys as little like wood blocks and the uh, uh, yellow and pink guys as, little, as springs with different spring constants. Okay, so this is a very common layout paradigm. And I'm gonna show you how this works in this, this sort of one pass box constraints uh, approach to layout. So the inputs to the, the algorithm are the overall min and max width and min and max height, the constraints we got from our parent. And the outputs are, we gotta figure out our overall size to tell our parent, and we have to figure out the size and position of each of our children. So in this scenario, for simplicity, I've set the min uh, width and height to basically zero. So we have flexibility, and this gray box represents the min and max height that we're allowed to be. And then I've shown you the answer, but we're going to build up the answer in steps. So step one is we have to lay out our inflexible children, so the wood blocks in this block and spring model. We have to ask them, how big would you like to be, since they're allowed to have an opinion about how big they like to be. So what constraints should we give them? So, um, well, for their, we're doing a row, so for their height, it's pretty easy. They could either be zero height, or they can be as high as I'm allowed to be. If they're taller than I'm allowed to be, then I'm in trouble because I can't fit them inside of myself. So that's sort of natural. And then the width, well, they're allowed to be as small as they want to be. That's up to them. And then actually, we let them be as wide as they want to be all the way out to infinity. And why infinity? You know, Forrest has a puzzled look on his face, and that's a you know, very good question. And so actually, in the first version of the system, we didn't have an infinity here. We gave it the uh, max width, the incoming max width, so our own max width. But oh, that's natural. But it turns out that that causes a lot of sort of subtle problems. So if you imagine a child who doesn't really know how big he wants to be, he's looking for some guidance from you. If you give him a max width, he'd be like, sounds great. I, I love that max width. I'll be exactly that wide. And what if you have two of those guys? Now you're out of space, right? So you can't really fit them. And it turns out that any value you pick here is either going to be too small, meaning if they all pick that size, you wouldn't fill up, or it'd be too big, so if they all pick that size, they'd be too, you'd overflow. And so there's actually no good value to give here. So we don't want to give zero, because then they would all have to be zero width. So we give them infinity, which says, I have no opinion. You have to tell me how big you are. So okay, so we give them these constraints, and they come back, and the green guy says, I want to be this big, and the red guy says, I want to be that big. Great. Um, so we write down that information, we add up their, their width, and we say, um, well, how big should we be? 
So rows have the opinion they're just going to fill up all the space, because that's usually what you want. So they fill up all the space, and they want to say how much space is left. After we've allocated space for all these inflexible children, I just take my overall width, and I subtract out the sum of my child's width, right? And so I have a bunch of free space left that I'm going to allocate to these flexible uh, children. So I just take the free space, and I divide it by the sum of those flex factors, and that tells me how much space is I'm going to allocate for each unit of flex factor. So a child that has two units of flex factor will get twice that amount of space, and a child that has one unit of flex factor get one. Right? So when I lay out the flexible children, I give them these sorts of constraints. So their width, I tell them exactly how wide to be. I say, you're going to be exactly enough size that you fill up all my free space that I have left in my layout. And the height, well, it's up to you. You can be as you know, short as you want, or you can fill up all of my max height, all the way up to my max height, whatever, whatever you like. So they come back and they say, oh, okay, I, I agree. You told me exactly how wide to be. I'm exactly that wide. And here's how much height I need for that width. So they follow the sort of within height out model, if you will. So that's great. So now I've got sizes for all of my children, and I have to figure out how to position them. Well, the positioning algorithm is pretty simple. I just go through an order, and I, I position the first one at the first base, and I increment by its width, and the next one, the next one, the next one. And because the constraints have all, I've given them constraints such that when this adds up, it adds up to exactly the width that I was expecting, and that's how big I am. And so for the height, there are many choices for how to position people. So there's a, so for flex or row, there's a choice I want to align them all to the top or the bottom or the center or whatever you like. So here I've center aligned them, right? So I have all their heights. So my height is the max of all their heights. And then for each one, I know exactly how much to offset it because I know its height. But notice here, I couldn't figure out their uh, position until I knew all the sizes of all the children. And then once I knew all the sizes of all the children, I could position them without touching them. Right, so they, in no way could they, could their size depend on their position, right? Because they don't even know what their position is. This is in contrast to other systems like the web, where on the web the size of an object depends on its position on the screen. Um, yep, and then I, I, I'm done. I've laid out my flex just the way I said I would do it. Yeah, so you could align to the top or the bottom. So then instead of centering them vertically, I would just give them all zeros as their, as their uh, x-coordinate. Before I see the question. Um, so how come like, your flexible children are like too big, right? Because you told them they could be five. Ah. You just assume that the <coughs> free space is possible. Yes, this is a fascinating question. So it turns out that just because you're given... Oh, sorry. The question is, what happens if the inflexible children is too big? I told them they could be infinitely big, and they all decided to be huge. I didn't have enough space for them. What should I do? Yeah, so it's fascinating. So the, what the box constraints really say is, here's how much space you're allowed to, to occupy during layout. So that doesn't say how big your children need to be. So for example, if your children are bigger, that just means that they extend off the side, right? So I can either paint them out there. I don't have to paint within my bounds. Or what actually what we do is we clip them. We say, okay, you're too big. I'm going to only draw the parts of you that are actually visible. So they act, occupy that much space, but they, there's, you can't see them because they're, they're clipped away. So, so like if the green guy is too big, then you're not going to draw, you know, the green guy is wider than the whole world and not the other guy. Yeah, so he says if the green guy is too big, you just won't see the pink guy or the red guy. Mm -hmm. that's, that's accurate. We don't need to call the build function. We're not the build function. We don't call the main function. Uh, so in this layout, we do. We have fancier layouts that are smart and do things like that that avoid unnecessary layout and building. But flex is sort of at least as presented here, is pretty simple. So, um, yeah, so actually, there's a debug mode you can turn on that will draw a little red box whenever you overflow your flexes, just so you, because, you know, you might not want that, so you might want to be told about that. Oh, so I told you that, so notice that we have this within hideout property for the flexible children, right? Mm -hmm. We told them exactly how wide they were going to be, and then we asked them how tall they were going to be. So if you imagine just rotating this thing to be a column, right? Totally reasonable to have a flexible layout that's vertical, right? So now the flexible children in a vertical layout, you tell them their height, and they tell you their width. So it turns out we needed uh, height in width out, even though when we first saw that, it seemed like a weird thing, but it, it actually arises quite naturally just in, in vertical flex layouts. And it turns out this constraint-based, you know, simple uh, algorithm is sufficient to generate you know, a lot of different layouts. In fact, we have a, you know, 
complete implementation of material design and all of its you know, visual and layout properties just done with this, this algorithm. Um, it's kind of remarkable. So I, when we first started the project, I was a little skeptical that these like simple constraints would be enough. And that's why we, one of the reasons we, why we have render object is this very general purpose thing. We thought, oh, we might need to specialize it to do some other kind of complicated thing. But it turns out, no, you can actually do everything you want um, just with this simple algorithm. So what's neat about the algorithm being simple is now we can reason about it and exploit its properties to make things go fast. So as an example, you notice at some point, I might give a child a tight constraint, right? Which means the child has to be exactly a certain size. And what that nicely does is it, it provides a cut in the data flow of the layout algorithm, right? Anything that, so if you imagine that this edge here that's labeled as a tight constraint says the child has to be exactly a certain size, then whatever happens down in that subtree with respect to layout can't possibly affect the rest of the tree, right? Because his only communication with the rest of the tree is his size that he reported back up the algorithm. But since his size has to be exactly the one that matches the constraint, there's no choice for his size. So whatever crazy layout thing is happening there, that information can't propagate to the rest of the tree. So this creates what we call a, a relay out boundary. And we compute these implicitly just from watching the algorithm, the constraint solver execute. And so it basically says, if somebody in this subtree wants to change his size or position, that change is contained to the subtree. So when we uh, produce that next frame, we only need to consult this subtree. We don't need to touch the rest of the entire tree. And so that makes things much, much more efficient. So I said it was a linear algorithm. Actually, because of these properties, it's actually sublinear because you don't even touch the parts of the tree that are, uh, is have, that are isolated from the parts that undergo a layout. And there are actually several different cases. So tight constraints are one, one case. Um, another case that we recognize is when a, a child, when a parent asks a child to lay out, he supplies a flag that says whether he's going to use the child's size in the rest of his computation. And if he says no, that also creates a, a relay out boundary because then if the child changes size, it doesn't affect anything else because the parent didn't listen to the size. It was irrelevant from the parent's point of view. And that actually comes up in, a, in a, um, another, another case is where uh, a child can report that his size depends only on his incoming constraints. So it's not, it's the, he says, for example, a child that always expands to fill his constraints, he's sized by his parent. Whatever his parent told him is his constraints, he immediately knows what his size is. What his children do don't matter. And that also creates a relay out boundary. And uh, just from these three simple observations about the constraint solver, actually the incremental layouts in the system turn out to be really quite small, just as you sort of naturally write widgets and naturally build up applications. So I wanted to, to touch on one more point before moving on to painting. So you notice, what order did we visit the children in our layout? Well, first we visited the inflexible children, and then we visited the flexible children. So I first, first visited the, the green guy, then the red guy, and then I came back and I did the, the yellow guy and the pink guy. Right? So that's in contrast to the order in which I'm going to paint my children. So I paint my children in order from left to right in the order they exist in the tree. But in layout, I visited them in a different order. So this is motivation for why you want painting to be a separate tree walk from layout, because you're going to visit the children in a different order. So that's in contrast to other systems that uh, unify the layout and painting algorithms into one walk of the tree. They end up in uh, having to do these careful shenanigans to, to deal with the fact that the paint order is not always the same as the information flow order for the layout. So here we do them as just separate walks, and that just each one is one linear walk of the whole tree from top to bottom, conceptually. And that matters if they're going to be overlapping or transparent or something like that? Yeah, so for example, uh, in this layout, they're all next to each other, but another layout besides a flex is a stack. So the stack is just puts them all on top of each other, and so it really matters what order you paint them in. And they're also, so a stack has positioned and non-positioned children Similarly, it has to visit them in a sort of funny order during layout and non-visual non order. Okay, painting phase. So we, we figured out where everything is and how big it is, but we haven't figured out what it looks like, which is sort of, you know, only half the battle, as G.I. Joe would say. So how do we paint? Well, you say, oh, paint's really easy. You just walk the whole tree in depth first order, and you pass around your offset, so where you are on the screen, and then you tell each thing to just paint itself there. Because we already know 
where it is and how big it is. There's not that much choice. It just has to draw, right? Simple. One slide. Uh, not quite. <laughs> so the complication with painting is that you have to deal with layers. So if you were painting everything to one buffer, then that would be the end of the story. But it turns out that painting things to one buffer is very constraining. So for example, suppose you had a, suppose this uh, yellow thing in here was a video. So it's something that's gonna be drawn by some other part of the system that you don't interact with. or some like hardware video codec that's just gonna like write video textures and then you're gonna draw them. And you wanna draw some things behind the video and some things on top of the video. That means you have to divide up your drawing into two different pieces, the part that's below the video and the part that's above. So later when you composite in the video, it everything looks correct. So for example, so you can draw like a play button on top of the video. So the, the tricky thing in painting is basically figuring out in which layer the painting command should go. Okay. So conceptually, you can think of these layers as like buffers of pixels. We don't actually make pixels out of them. We just keep them as vectors, but the, you don't have to worry about that too much. So during the paint phase, we go walk the tree in depth order, and then we paint into these layers. So here, the, the green uh, bubbles are painting into the green layer, right? Number four here, he's a, a video or like a child view or some something that needs to be composited in order to paint correctly. So he gets painted into his own layer. And then everything that comes after number four in paint order gets drawn into the red layer. So the interesting thing to observe is that the, uh, on the second row on the left, he's got some green and some red aspects to him. So what that meant is you should imagine that I painted one, I painted the background for two, and then two painted three and four, and then on the way up, uh, he decided he wanted to paint some more things, so then the fifth painting happened. So this, when he paints after his children, his painting commands go into a different place, a different layer than when he painted before his children. So they end up in the red layer. And then we go up to, to the top. The top has no more painting to do. He goes down to his child, and his child also ends up after the yellow in paint order. So there's this funny thing where a given render object isn't allocated to a unique layer. His painting can actually be split across multiple layers. So this is in contrast to basically, um, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any other system that does this. So for example, in Coco, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between UI views and CA layers. You can't split a UI view into multiple CA layers. Uh, similarly on the web, you, you can't split a single render object into multiple layers. It's painting doesn't work. And there are always funny bugs because of that. But in this system, we basically do that. So the way we do it is we, it's not just offsets that we're sending down the tree. There's actually stuff that comes back up in our one pass walk. In particular, the target layer. So which layer you ought to draw into something your children tell you as part of painting. So you tell the child, you know, go paint yourself over here. And he tells you, hey, uh, you should continue painting in this other layer. So if, you, if you're like a programming language person, you would think of this as like continuation passing. So he passes the continuation of where you should continue painting. Um, and in that way, the, the computation of the compositing strategy, so which things are painted into which layer, and the actual recording of the painting commands is unified into one walk that's done in the sort of simple one pass down up algorithm. So that's nice, but now you see there are all these funny non-local effects, right? The fact that this yellow guy had to be composited had an, had an impact on this red guy in some totally other part of the tree. So, like, so that would make painting very complicated, right? Because any effect in one part of the tree could have an effect on some other radically different part of the tree. And so if this guy said, oh, I want to change my painting, in principle, you'd have to repaint everything in the whole universe to make that change happen. And so, well, we had this clever idea from layout that we should introduce these re-layout boundaries. What if we did something similar for painting and artificially introduced repaint boundaries? So what a repaint boundary does is basically say, I'm going to artificially pretend that this child needs his own uh, composited layer. And what that means is it, it produces uh, sort of uh, that the effects in that subtree are then contained. They don't affect other parts of the tree. So now this blue guy has to be painted into the blue layer, regardless of whether this yellow guy exists or needs his own layer or anything crazy like that. 
the relay up boundary basically has, has stabilized the the algorithm so that it, it's uh, the non-local effects are contained in that subtree. I'm getting a little skeptical look, so maybe I uh, I have another. Well, let's see. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. So he asked, with the re layout boundaries, we computed automatically for you by looking at the data flow. But these repaint boundaries, I didn't tell you how we computed them automatically. And you might be suspicious that that means that we don't know how to compute them automatically. And the, that's actually true. So we can place these repaint boundaries anywhere in the tree. It's a very flexible concept. But we don't know where is the optimal place to paint them. So if you imagine, if you put every different render object in their own repaint boundary, they all use composite layers you end up with a really big stack of composite layers. And that might be inefficient because now you have to manage all these layers. Or if you texturize them, so you turn them into actual pixels on the GPU, then you have a lot of pixels, many more pixels than you had on the screen. On the other hand, you don't want to have zero. So basically, you don't want to have everyone coupled into one painting pass. So the, the optimal uh, repaint boundaries for your app is somewhere between everything and nothing. And where to draw that boundary is actually it has a large effect on performance of the app, and it's just something that's um, difficult to compute automatically. Um, so it's, uh, you should think about the structure of your app and say, when this part of my app repaints, what parts of the app always repaint with it? Or are there parts of the app that are repainting for different reasons? So a good example of that is like a scrolling uh, component of your app. When this thing scrolls, suppose you have a scroller on the left and like a smiley face on the right, when the scroller scrolls, the smiley face doesn't need to repaint. Right? So somewhere between the scroller and the smiley face, you should have a repaint boundary to contain the effects of its painting. So this diagram is, is intended to show how the repaint boundary changes the structure of the compositing layer tree. So on the left was our original layer tree. We had the green layer, this, uh, the yellow layer, and the red layer. So they're painting here in a pre-order traversal. And on the right, we have what the tree looks like after you've introduced the repaint boundary. So you get the sort of dark blue or black layer that is the artificial layer that we introduced to contain the effects. And now the, we have this extra blue layer to paint after the black layer. Yeah? Follow-up question about the repaint boundaries. So I presume that the widget framework that Photo provides does most of the election. Like, I don't have to think about when I add a scrollable that I need to put in a repaint boundary. Yeah, so the question is, do you really have to add all these repaint boundaries manually? That sounds like a big pain. Um, and the answer is uh, no, that a lot of the, the basic widgets that we provide you know where you should put repaint boundaries. So like the scrolling widget has a repaint boundary in there because that's a common case. And it's when you're sort of building more complicated things that, or you're building your own scroller or your own scroll-like interaction or something that you might have to think about where to put in the repaint boundaries. Okay, so that was painting. So to generate all these layers, what do we do with them? Why do we even have them? So one benefit you have for breaking your scene up into these composite layers is you can update your visual appearance very fast. So if all you're doing is moving around these layers or changing their offsets or transforms, then you don't have to do any of the rest of the work that we've talked to up to this point, because you have everything split apart into pieces. You just need to draw those big pieces again. So if you want to move the yellow layer to the, to the right, you don't have to touch anything else. You just move it to the, to the right and then recomposite your layers. So a good motivating example for why you want to do this is scrolling. So here, imagine that you have a, um, a, a list that's going to scroll. So the gray things are the different items in the list. And the dark gray boundary is the like viewport. So we're like, that's the part of the list that we can see. So as we scroll up here, if you didn't do anything clever, you would have to at least repaint the entire viewport every frame of the scroll, right? Because you know this pixel changed from, from white to gray, and so that pixel has to repaint. So we go explore the tree until we find a repaint boundary, and then we repaint that whole thing. Well, that turns out to be sort of less efficient than it could be. And scrolling is, is a very um, taxing operation on the system. You want to basically have scrolling be as efficient as possible. So what you do is you... Uh, use a separate layer for each of the items in the scrollable list. So here, when I move from the uh, first 
part of the scroll to the second part of the scroll, all I did was shift those boxes up. I didn't have to repaint them. I didn't have to relay re out them. I didn't have to do anything. I just took their either their already recorded drawing commands or if they've been turned into pixels, just their pixels and spew them back onto the screen. And as I scroll up, I reveal this new item. So the only amount of painting I have to do is when I re reveal a new item, I have to go create a layer for him, paint him, right? But now I have him, and as I scroll, I don't have to do any more work. I just have to slide him around. And when this green guy slides up the top, I can reclaim him. And that way, I get this nice sort of recycling list view sort of almost for free out of the whole system. So as these buffers or layers become available on the top, they sort of can appear on the bottom. And you only ever have a finite number of them as you scroll through this system. This also connects up to earlier what we talked about, where the, each of these um, items in the list don't know what their offset is, right? So they, their behavior or appearance can't possibly depend on their offset because they don't know what their offset is. So then I know that I can just move them without talking to them, right? And so that means I, I don't have to do, like, I, the amount of work I have to do to do a composited scroll is essentially like very, very little. And so on sort of like, you know, three-year-old devices, we can do composited scroll in about like one millisecond. Um, it's pretty fast. How does this compare to what other systems do for this scrolling? Uh, it's basically, everyone uses the same underlying commands on the GPU to do scrolling like this. So it's only a question of how much work was it to author and how, so in this system, we built up the abstractions so that when you use one of these things, it just feels totally natural. So for example, on Android, you have this recycling list view guy with like a delegate with like six methods you have to implement. It's very complicated, right? But in this system, all you did was you just had a widget with a build function, and then we wrapped it in a repaint boundary for you. And then we, because of the invariance about the offsets and stuff like that, everything just works out perfectly so that composite scrolling is, like hits the optimal path just sort of by default. First. So um, we talked a little bit about like what you mean by composite here, right? Like, are you actually like you render all the dead and like print buffers and all of them, or are they like like vectors and then yeah, yeah, like, okay, all of them and then that's good. I, I sort of glossed over this, and I actually have four minutes. So I can actually cover it, which is good. So Forrest asked, "What do you mean by compositing?" I'm a graphics guy. This doesn't look like compositing to me. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm punching it up. Yeah. So um, traditionally. Compositing means I had pixels recorded in a texture. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna blip that texture onto the screen in order. And so we actually do that sometimes, but we don't always do that. So each of these um, layers can either be represented as a, a vector, so like a display list, so a list of drawing commands to execute, or we can bake that, list, that display list into a texture. And then we, once we have the texture, we can blip the pixels directly to the screen. And so the, the question is, when do we decide to texturize these layers? And so we have, uh, so in other systems, they make very strong commitments about this. So Coco says, you know, if every CA layer, it's a, it's a texture, we're gonna have lots of GPU memory, it's gonna be okay. Um, uh, Android framework says the opposite. It says, I never ever wanna make textures, I don't have a lot of memory, I'm gonna redraw my display list from scratch every frame, and I'm gonna make that really efficient. So in this system actually takes a sort of, uh, middle approach to these things. So what happens is if you draw the texture three times, if you draw a layer three times as a vector, it will be like, you keep drawing the same layer, I bet it's worth making a texture out of it. And the third time, we'll first draw it to a texture and then blit it from the texture. And from then on, as long as you keep drawing it, we'll just draw it directly from the texture. And it turns out that uh, three is kind of a magic number. So if you picked one, <laughs> then that means you would always draw indirectly through textures, right? And that would be not efficient in some cases, like imagine the like circular progress indicator, right? In, in material design. So it's this like arc that keeps changing size and keeps like rotating around and never draws the same frame twice, like ever, <laughs> right? So there's no point in drawing it indirectly through a texture. You, will, you might as well just draw it directly from its command. But imagine like a drawer that's like sliding out. That thing is identical, all it's changing is its offset. So if you capture the drawer into a, in its own repaint boundary and you can, translate it uh, in the compositor, then after you've done this like a couple times, you're like, hey, I bet this is gonna stay like this. And so you can actually just texturize the drawer as a whole thing and then move it out. Um, and so why three? Um, I don't know, you could try four, you could try one, you could try two. Three is actually, seems to be pretty good. It's actually a, 
uh, observation across many, many systems in computer science and electrical engineering. You have two-bit saturating counters. Turns out to be pretty good. So that's where the three comes from. It's a two-bit saturating counter. Yeah. Yeah, so okay, so when I said three, I so he said, what if we have lots of tiny stuff and that seems like a waste to make all, all of, yeah, so the three is not the only answer. There's, a, there's some more heuristics that decide when we should texturize and when we should not texturize. And I suspect as the system matures, we'll need to tune those heuristics. So there's a heuristic that says, hey, this layer doesn't, it's not really that complicated. It's really just a big friggin' rectangle. There's no point in like storing uh, pixels for it. We might as well just draw it. Or there's a heuristic that says, hey, it's got a lot of empty space in it. It's going to be really inefficient. I've got a lot of transparent pixels. It's kind of useless. So there, there are various heuristics that, you just, that we use to decide whether to texturize something. But the nice thing is, as authors, you don't have to worry about any of that. That's all um, done by, by the compositor. Maybe we'll, we probably should expose some sort of control levers for that to let you tune it yourself, I guess. But we don't do that yet. Yeah, Andrew. So you want to texturize things that we paint or whatever. Is that equivalent to automatically making a layer? Yeah, so the, so Andrew is saying, uh, if we auto texturize after three things, why can't we just auto layerize after three things? Yeah, so uh, we should probably investigate that. So if you run in debug mode, we actually keep track of all the repaint boundaries that you put in to your app. We keep statistics about them, about how effective they are. We'll say like this repaint boundary was like awesome. Ninety nine percent of the time, the child and the parent painted at different times. Or we'll say this one was terrible. Basically, it was always the case that the parent and child like had to repaint together. There was never never a time when this repaint boundary actually separated two different painting operations. And so we maybe could use that information to automatically generate uh, repaint boundaries. Uh, we haven't really investigated that too much. But the repaint boundaries. So the repaint boundaries are like trading how much of the tree you have to walk or how many layers you have to deposit. <laughs> That's right. So it's basically, so he's saying, what does the actual trade-off involve in a, a repaint boundary? So the actual trade-off is a trade-off between the amount of time you spend in the paint phase recording commands versus the amount of memory you take and the amount of management overhead you have for these layers. So if you had infinite memory and we had really good memory management, uh, really good tools for ma managing these things, you would make everything a repaint boundary. And like you can imagine you can make every pixel on your screen a repaint boundary. And then you'd be like, we'd get really good at managing the pixels. We'd build some sort of specialized hardware for it. We'd call it a GPU, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it, it's sort of about moving work from different parts of the pipeline to other parts of the pipeline, right? So if you're a really beefy GPU that can just take every command you fire at it and draw it, then you wouldn't ever want any repaint boundaries. It wouldn't make any sense, right? But, if you, but in reality, the, the pipeline that your app goes through to render you know, has different constraints on it. They're executes on a CPU and a GPU, which have different relative strengths. You have different amounts of CPU memory, different amounts of GPU memory. And so a lot of sort of implicit in these thing, in, in these different knobs you can turn are how do you rebalance your workload across this sort of diverse set of computing resources. And so what we've done is we've basically picked an approach that is optimized for mobile devices. So in contrast to um, other systems that were designed for, for example, desktop devices, where the like GPUs didn't even exist when they were designed, right? So then we've designed the whole system to be roughly optimized for mobile devices. And then there are a few little knobs you can tune to basically say, my particular workload or my particular app, how do I make efficient use of all the resources that are available at each stage of the pipeline? It's like changes like the transitions cause like performance right? Like all the time, right? You're, you're saying like, oh, well, now we're going to, you know, add a repaint boundary here. Now we're compositing this texture. Maybe it goes faster. Maybe it goes slower, or something like that. Right? Yeah. So, for, so his question was, uh, this like auto texturization and doesn't this add a lot of noise to your your pipeline, which might <coughs> cause you to miss your frame deadlines? Uh, yeah. So I was worried about that too, um, but it turns out not to actually be that bad. So the reason that my hypothesis is. Uh, they're not all synchronized. So they don't all hit, it's not like we say, okay, this frame, we're gonna texturize everything, right? That would cause a big hiccup. But as you see, as you scroll by, basically what happens is this dark blue guy appears on screen for one frame, two frames, then he texturizes, then he goes, right? So as long as the like 
you know, it's not like you're drawing them all at the same time, right? So like, it turns out not to actually add that much noise to the um, to the pipeline. So you have, there's lots of like diagnostics. So if you go into observatory and you look at the timeline and you record a timeline, you can see a time-oriented view of what's going on. You can see each phase of the pipeline will be labeled and you can see the order that they execute, how much time they take relative to each other. And you can see things like texturization show up as like, and you can see things like, uh, you know, how big, how much layout you're doing, or either if you even visit the layout phase of the pipeline at all, or whether your frame can purely be produced by painting or purely be produced by compositing. Yeah. So do you always turn the layers into pixels before you composite them? Because right? you were saying that after three, right, you store the pixels, right? Or is it? Or yeah. So this question is, do you? Yeah, so his, his question is, do we always turn them into pixels or do sometimes we draw them as vectors? No, so when, when we're drawing them as vectors, we just draw them in immediate mode as vectors. We just issue a bunch of triangles. Like if you have a path, we'll issue all the triangles for the path. How do you determine whether frames one, two, and three are the same? That's a good question. So the, uh, the display lists are immutable. <coughs> so once you've recorded a display list, there's no way of altering it. All you can do is tear it down and record a new one. So they just have unique IDs, and so we just keep track. Well, the display list have just unique IDs, and so if the, we just remember the ID that we had drew last time. So we, said we drew display list 27 last time, so this one is display list 27. It's immutable, so it must be the same thing. And we also record the matrix. So we will we'll always draw exactly perfectly onto the pixel grid of the device. So if you change the matrix, then we'll change the matrix in a way that, that changes the projection from the layer to the screen, then we'll say, okay, that doesn't count as drawing the same thing because we want to hit the exact pixels. So for example, in, in other systems like Coco, if you take a UI layer, uh, UI view, and you transform it, you won't always hit exactly the pixel grid, which means you'll get a little bit of aliasing. Um, so that's a trade-off for performance, right? So if you, uh, that means they're able to draw from textures more often, but you don't get like pixel perfect out output. And I expect eventually we'll want to have that capability in the system, and we definitely can. But right now the system is tuned for pixel perfect output. And then if that's too slow, then we'll like reduce the quality to get performance if necessary. Yeah, so just to orient, this was the uh, we talked about these three phases of the pipeline. Um, yeah, I want to thank everybody for coming. We can take more questions if you have it, but I guess you guys asked a lot of questions already. So. Wait, the you know, the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the one of the widgets is capable of to your children. So does it end up having in squared behavior in order to do that? So yeah. Oh, is that why it says this is expensive? Then we don't know. Yeah. So he says uh, some widgets can take their size from their child. Does that introduce n squared behavior? And so the answer is. Uh, Slightly subtle. So the the simple answer to that question is no. It doesn't introduce in general doesn't in, introduce n squared behavior. Because remember, my parent gave me my constraints. I was allowed to talk to my children, and then I reported my size. So if I want my size to exactly match my child, then all I have to do is ask him, "Hey child, what's your size?" They'll tell me, and then I can just tell my parent that, that was my size. So in general, if you want to shrink wrap your children, that's that's basically free. Um, but there are cases where you want to do something <laughs> slightly different than that. So they don't actually come up that much, but when they come up, there's sort of no other way of solving these problems. So a good example of that is the, um, uh, a pop-up menu in material design. So how wide should a pop-up menu in material design be? So the answer is he should be as wide as his, the widest line of text contained in the menu, rounded up to an integral number of eight pixels. Okay, that's what they wrote in the spec. Sounds great. So um, if you just asked each child to please lay out at your size, and then I'm going to size myself to the max of you plus eight pixels, that wouldn't actually be correct. And the reason it wouldn't be correct is because of Arabic. So in Arabic, you instead of writing from left to right, you write from right to left, right? Which means the menu item in Arabic should be... Uh, 
all of the text of the menu items should be uh, aligned vertically on the right edge, on the right edge. <laughs> and which means you have to, when you, when you lay out the children, you have to tell them how big the menu is actually going to be in order to get the correct uh, text layout. And so how do you know? It's like a chicken and egg problem, right? So and this is the case where you actually need those intrinsic sizing functions that I sort of put up on the slides but didn't really tell you much about. So intrinsic sizing lets you ask your child, hey, uh, how big would you be if you, well, you get four different questions to ask, and they're sort of subtle what they are. But the one you want in this case is you ask the child, how big is your longest line of text effectively? So what is, what is your width beyond width? If I made you wider, you wouldn't get any shorter which is an abstract way of saying, I don't want you to take any line breaks. <laughs> take as few line breaks as possible and tell me how wide you are. This is what the menu needs to know. And th in those cases, you can get n-squared behavior because if you, if you keep asking that question recursively as you go down the tree, then you could be always asking that same <laughs> like text at the bottom. Hey, dude, how wide are you if you only had one line? Right? You ask him that question uh, n-squared times. So you, it is possible to get that. So those are very rare. So if, like, for example, in, we have a stocks app, which is like the... Um, it's like the uh, kitchen sink app of all widgets that we've ever thought of. It combined in the craziest ways possible. It has like two. <laughs> so it, it does occur, and you need, you need to do it in order to get correct behavior. But, oops, I didn't want to do that. Um, but for the line share cases, this one pass simple constraint based system is sufficient to get the, the correct layout. Yeah, Igor. Is there any interaction between uh, the layout system and the build system? In this case, I'm thinking of as a result of layout, there's overflow. I want to build the scroll bar. Yeah, so Jaeger's question is uh, Ian gave this talk that explained the build phase in detail, and I gave this talk that explained the layout and paint phase, and I told you it was a pipeline. What if, I, what if my build wants to depend on my layout? And so when I said it was a pipeline, I sort of actually lied. So the, the build phase and the layout phase are allowed to. Um, intermix with each other. So in the middle of layout, you can do some more building. Uh, you can't do building, you can't do layout in the middle of building. So I guess you're allowed to have build phases inside of your layout phases. And this actually follows from a very important property of the system that I discussed, which is that a render object doesn't know anything about its children. So what you do is you have a, uh, another kind of render object, another kind of render box, whose child model is in lazy in some sense. So it basically says, when I need to go lay out my children, because no one else has ever been able to talk to them, because no one else knows what my child model is, I can create them just in time in order to do their layout. So for example, we have this lazy scrolling guy who only build uh, widgets that are actually in the viewport. And the way this works is during layout, he says, oh, I, I don't have enough children to fill my viewport. I need to go build one more, lay him out. Oh, still don't have enough. I got to go build another one. OK, lay him out. And these phases are. Basically, uh, because you've never visited those children before, and you can never have to visit them again, right? That you never have to get more information from some other part of layout that tells you, oh, I need more children to deal with this problem. Then you get this very clean, um, uh, infinite scrolling uh, mechanism. I want to give a whole talk about that thing because I think it's freaking. <laughs> <laughs> to really understand it, you have to go into a little bit more depth. But. Great, thanks.